Hello, I am Jake, the Nomad, and today we have got a lovely friend with us, whose name is Jane. Hello, I'm Jane. Welcome back, Jake, to England. It's so nice to have you. Oh, thanks, Jane. It's lovely. Aren't you going to tell us a story today? Yes, certainly I shall. Would you care to join me in my storytelling room? Of course, my dear. Jane is going to tell us a wonderful story today. So, let's go to Jane's story room. Good evening. This is Jane and I'm going to read to you the story of Romeo and Juliet, a Shakespeare story. On that warm summer's evening, the Capulet House was the brightest place in Verona. The walls of the ballroom were hung with silk tapestries, and candlelight from a dozen crystal chandeliers threw rainbows onto the heads of masked dancers. They twirled and twirled through the music, and laughter filled the air. On one side of the room, near a table laden with food and drink, stood a young girl, Juliet the daughter of Lord and Lady Capulet. She had removed her mask and loosened her black hair, so it hung over her shoulders. Her face, flushed from the heat of the dance, was radiant, and her beauty was obvious to all who looked at her. She seemed unaware that someone was watching her. A few steps away, a young man stood gazing at her. He had never seen such a loveliness before in his whole life. Surely I must be mistaken, he thought. Surely if I look a second time, I will find that her eyes are too close together, her nose too long, or her mouth too wide. Moving slowly towards her, as in a trance, the young man lifted his mask so he could see Juliet more clearly, and the more he gazed at her, the more perfect her face seemed. Almost without thinking, Romeo pushed his way towards Juliet until he found himself standing at her side. Gently, he took her hand. Juliet turned her head, her soft brown eyes wide with surprise. On the other side of the room, Tybalt, Lord Capulet's fiery young nephew, recognised the young man who was holding Juliet's hand. He strode angrily towards the door, and just as he was about to leave, his uncle caught him by the sleeve. "'Where are you going?' asked Lord Capulet. "'To fetch my rapier,' Tybalt replied. Lord Montague's son, Romeo, has dared to enter the house. Leave him, said Lord Capulet. There was a terrible feud between the Capulets and the Montagues, and the Prince of Verona had forbidden any more fighting between the families, on pain of death. Tybalt's face was ashen with rage, but tomorrow Romeo will boast to his friends about how he danced at the Capulet's ball and escaped without being noticed. He will make us look like fools. Lord Capulet put his hands on Tybalt's shoulders, forcing him to stop and listen. I hate the Montagues as deeply as you do, Tybalt, he said. Our two families have been at war with each other for as long as anyone can remember. But the Prince's word is the law in this city, and there must be no more fighting. You understand? Now if you cannot keep your temper like a man, go to your room and sulk like a boy. Tybalt broke free from his uncle's grasp and glared across the room to Romeo. You will pay for this one day, Montague, he vowed softly. I will make you pay. One. Juliet glanced around at the young man beside her, at his glossy brown hair and startlingly grey eyes that were filled with shyness and wonder. His mouth was curved in half a smile, and though it made her blush to look, Juliet found that she could not take her eyes from his face, nor her hand from his. My lady, Romeo said, if my hand has offended yours by holding it, please forgive me. My hand is not offended, sir, said Juliet, smiling at him, and nor am I. Some power that neither of them understood had drawn them together like a moth to a flame. They kissed, and the ballroom, the musicians and dancers seemed to disappear, leaving them feeling as though they were the only two people in the world. When their lips parted, Romeo looked at Juliet and thought, All those other times when I thought I was in love, I was like a child playing a game. This time I am truly in love. I wonder, could she possibly feel the same? 
Before he could ask, an elderly woman bustled up to them. My lady, she said to Juliet, your mother is asking for you. Juliet frowned, shrugged helplessly at Romeo, and turned and walked away. Romeo caught the old woman by the arm. Do you know that lady, he demanded. Well, sir, that's Juliet, Lord Capulet's daughter, said the woman. I've been her nurse since she was a baby, and I know who you are too, young man. Take my advice and leave this house before there's trouble. That night, Juliet couldn't get to sleep. She could not only think of Romeo. It was warm and the moonlight was shining on the trees in the orchard below. Juliet stepped out onto her balcony, but she was so troubled by what her nurse had told her, she had hardly noticed how lovely the orchard looked. How can I be in love with someone I ought to hate? she sighed. Oh, Romeo, why did you have to be a Montague? If you had been born with any other name, I could tell you how much I love you. Romeo stepped out of the shadows into the trees. Call me your love, he said. It's o the only name I want. Juliet looked down from her balcony and gasped. How did you get here? If anyone catches you, they will kill you. I climbed the orchard wall, said Romeo. I had to see you again. I loved you the moment I first saw you, and I wanted to know if you felt the same. Juliet's face brightened with joy, then darkened in doubt. How can I be sure of your love? How can I be sure that you will not forget me as soon as tonight is over? Romeo looked up into Juliet's eyes and saw the way the moonlight was shining in them. He knew he would never love anyone else. Meet me at Friar Lawrence's chapel at noon tomorrow, and we shall be married, Romeo declared. Married, laughed Juliet, but we've only just met, and what will our parents say? Do we need to meet more than once to know our love is strong and real? Said Romeo, must we live apart because of our family's hatred? A part of Juliet knew that for them to marry would be mad and impossible, but another part of her knew that if she sent Romeo away now, she might never see him again, and she wasn't sure that she could bear that. Yes, she said, yes, I believe what we feel for each other is true, and yes, I'll meet you tomorrow at the chapel at noon. So the next day, Romeo and Juliet were married. The bell in the clock tower of the cathedral tolled twice. The main square of Verona sweltered in the hot sunshine and the air shimmered. Two young men were lounging beside a fo fountain and the taller of the two, Romeo's closest friend, Mercutio, dipped a handkerchief into the water and mopped his face. Where is he? he demanded tetchily. He should have been here an hour ago. His companion, Romeo's cousin, Benvilio, smiled at Mercutio's impatience. Some important business must have detained him, he said. A pair of pretty eyes more like, snorted Mercutio. But as he glanced across the square, he saw Romeo hurrying towards them. At last, Mercutio said sarcastically, I was beginning to think that the Queen of the Fairies had carried you off in your sleep. I have great news, said Romeo, but you must promise to keep it a secret. Mercutio looked at his friend. Oh, I am in love, said Romeo. Benvolio laughed. Mercutio groaned and shook his head. You're always in love, he cried. A girl only has to look at you sideways to make you fall for her. It's more than that this time, said Romeo. I'm in love with... Romeo, interrupted a harsh voice. Romeo turned and saw Tybalt with a group of sneering Capulets. Tybalt's right hand was resting on the hilt of his sword. You were at my family's house last night, and now you must pay for your insolence. Draw your sword. Romeo's eyes flashed with anger, then grew calm. I will not fight you, Tybalt, he said. It would be like fighting one of my own family. Why, you milksop, jeered Tybalt. You are as cowardly as the rest of the Montagues. Romeo, Romeo, gasped Mercutio. Are you going to stand and do nothing while he insults your family? I must, said Romeo. You do not understand. I have no choice. But I do, snarled Mercutio. His rapier flashed in the sunlight as he drew it. If you want to fight, Tybalt, I'm your man, he cried. In a moment, too fast to follow, Tybalt brought his sword and two young men began to fight in a dazzling speed. Help me stop them, Benvolio, pleaded Romeo. He caught Mercutio from behind, pinning his arms to his sides. As he did so, Tybalt lunged forward and drove to the point of his rapier through Mercutio's heart, fatally wounding him. 
A plague on both your houses, he whispered with his dying breath. When Romeo realised that his friend was dead, rage surged through him and his hatred of the Capulets brought a bitter taste to his mouth. Tybalt, he cried, drawing his rapier. One of us must join Mercutio in death. Then let our swords decide who it shall be, Tybalt snarled. Romeo hacked at Tybalt as though Tybalt were a tree that he wanted to cut down. At first, the watching Capulets laughed at Romeo's clumsiness, but then as Tybalt began to fall backwards towards the centre of the square, their laughter died. It was obvious that Tybalt was tiring and finding it difficult to defend himself. At last, Romeo and Tybalt stood face to face, their swords locked together. Tybalt's left hand fumbled at his belt and he drew out a dagger. Romeo, seeing the danger, clamped his left hand around Tybalt's wrist. They stumbled and struggled with each other. Tybalt flicked out a foot, intending to trip Romeo, but instead he lost his own balance, and the two enemies tumbled to the ground. Romeo fell on Tybalt's left hand, forcing the point of the dagger deep into Tybalt's chest. He felt Tybalt's dying breath against his cheek. A voice quick called out, Quick, the prince's guards! The Capulets scattered. Benvolio helped Romeo to his feet. Come on now, before it's too late. But Romeo did not hear him. He stared at Tybalt's body, and the full realisation of what he'd done fell on him like a weight. I've killed Juliet's cousin, he thought. I cannot, she cannot love a murderer. She will never forgive me. How can I let myself be such a fool? He, st he was still staring at Tybalt when the prince's guards reached him. That night, the Prince of Verona passed judgment on Romeo. The hatred of the Montagues and Capulets have cost two more lives. I want no more bloodshed. I will spare Romeo his life, but I will banish him to the city of Mantua. He must leave tonight, and if he is ever found in Verona, he will be put to death. When Friar Lawrence heard the news of Romeo's banishment, he was deeply upset. He had already married Romeo and Juliet in secret, hoping that one day their love would overcome the hatred between the Montagues and Capulets. But it seemed that hate had been too strong. After his evening meal, the friar went to his chapel to say a prayer for the young lovers. As he knelt in front of the altar, Friar Lawrence heard the sound of the chapel door opening and footsteps racing up the aisle. He stood, turned and saw Juliet, who flung herself sobbing at his feet. Help me, Friar Lawrence. My father wants me to marry Count Paris. I'd rather die than forsake Romeo. Do not despair, my child, Friar Lawrence urged. Surely you can reason with your father. I could not bring myself to tell him about Romeo, Juliet sobbed. I pleaded Tybalt's death had made me too full of grief to think of marriage. But father would not listen, and the wedding is to take place tomorrow. Father Lawrence looked troubled. There may be a way for you and Romeo to be together, my child, but it is dangerous, he said. Friar Lawrence took a tiny bottle of blue liquid from the pouch at his belt. Drink this tonight, he said, and you will fall into a deep sleep, sleep as deep as death. Your parents will believe that you are dead and will put your body into the Capulet tomb. But in two days you will be awake, alive and well. And Romeo, said Juliet, I will send him a message explaining everything, said Friar Lawrence. After you wake, you can go to Mantua in secret. And so on the morning of Juliet's wedding to Paris, the screams of the nurse woke the whole Capulet house. When the news of Juliet's death reached Benvolio, he rode straight to Mantua to Romeo. One of the travellers passed on the way was a monk who recognised him. Lord Benvolio, he called out, I have a letter for, for your cousin Romeo from Friar Lawrence. Out of my way! I have no time to stop, said Benvolio. The monk watched as Benvolio galloped by the road to Mantua. At that speed, the monk judged Benvolio would be in the city before evening. When Benvolio told Romeo that Juliet was dead, Romeo's heart broke, and for the hours he lay sobbing on his bed while outside day turned into night. During that time, Benvolio stayed by Romeo's side, and he had no idea how to comfort his grief-stricken friend. It was almost midnight before Romeo grew calm enough to speak. He sat up and wiped away his tears with the back of his hand. I must go to her, he said. But the prince has banished you, Benvolio reminded him. If you are s seen in the streets of Verona, it will mean your death. I'm not afraid of death, said Romeo. Without Juliet, my life means nothing. Go, wake the grooms and tell them to saddle my horse.
When Benvolio had left him alone, Romeo searched through the wooden chest at the foot of his bed until he found a green glass bottle that contained a clear liquid. I shall drink this poison and die at Juliet's side, he vowed. Romeo left Mantua at daybreak, refusing to let Benvolio accompany him. Once out of the city, he travelled along the winding country tracks so he could approach Verona without being seen. It was night when he arrived, and with the hood of his cloak drawn up to hide his face, he slipped in unrecognised through the city walls at the main gate. He went straight to the Capulet tomb, and it was almost as if someone had expected him, for the door was unlocked and the interior was lit by a burning torch. Romeo looked around, saw Tybalt's body, pale as candle wax, and then Juliet, laid out on a marble slab, her death shroud as white as a bridal gown. With a cry, Romeo rushed to her side and covered her face with kisses and tears. I cannot live without you, he whispered. I want your beauty to be the last thing my eyes see. We could not be together in life, my sweet love, but in death nothing shall part us. Romeo drew the cork from the poison bottle and raised it to his lips. He felt the vile liquid sting his throat. The darkness swallowed him. For a time there was no sound except the spluttering of the torch. And then Juliet began to breathe. She moaned, opened her eyes, and saw Romeo dead at her side with the empty poison bottle in his hand. At first she thought she was dreaming. When she reached out to touch Romeo's face and smelled the bitter scent of poison, she knew that the nightmare was real and that Friar Lawrence's plan had gone terribly wrong. She cradled Romeo in her arms and rocked him, weeping into his hair. If you had only waited a little longer, Juliet whispered and kissed Romeo again and again, desperately hoping there was enough poison on his lips that she too might die. Then she saw the torchlight gleam on the dagger at Romeo's belt, she drew the weapon and pressed its point to her heart. Now, dagger, take me to my love, she said, and pushed with all her strength. Friar Lawrence found the lovers a few hours later. They were huddled together like sleeping children. When Romeo and Juliet died, their hatred between the Montagues and Capulets died with them. United by grief, the two families agreed that Romeo and Juliet should be buried together. They paid for a statue of the lovers to be set over the grave, and on the base of the statue those words were carved. There never was a story of mo more woe than this of Juliet and Romeo. The sun for sorrow will not show his head. Go hence to have more talk of these sad things. The Prince of Verona The concept of love and hate in Romeo and Juliet. In Romeo and Juliet, Shakespeare weaves together two of the most powerful human emotions, love and hate. The bitter hatred in Romeo and Juliet results from the feud between the Montagues and the Capulets, two rich families in the Italian city of Verona. The feud has led to so many gang fights in the streets and that the Prince of Verona had ordered the fighting to stop on pain of death. Passionate love comes from Romeo and Juliet, who fall in love at first sight at a ball in the Capulet's house. Juliet is a Capulet and Romeo is a Montague, and the moment their lips meet, their fate is sealed. Tybalt, Juliet's cousin, sees them together and swears to take revenge for what he considers an insult to his family. Shakespeare shows how strangely alike love and hate are in the way they make people act without thinking. Hate causes the death of both Mercutio, Romeo's best friend, and Tybalt, Juliet's cousin. Love leads Romeo and Juliet into a chain of tragic events. Their happy wedding sets them on the road to a sorry end. At the end of the play, the young lovers are dead, and the Montagues and Capulets are brought together at last, united only by another powerful emotion, grief. The love and hate have cancelled each other out, and all that's left is sadness. Thank you all for staying and listening to this story. I would um, invite you to come back and listen to a few more stories of Shakespeare, As You Like It, Hamlet, A Midsummer Night's Dream, The Tempest, Richard III, and many more. Bye for now. 
Hope to see you again soon.